You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Sometimes I'd go like months without seeing my mates, weeks without seeing my mates, and something in my head, paranoia in the back of my head, was like, I hope they don't think I'm getting too big for my boots and too above my station. I hope they don't think I forgot about them and I've changed. I hope they don't think I've changed. So I'd find myself nipping down, just nipping down at the pub to see them. And then um, ultimately, when, when I, my first defeat came against Floyd Mayweather, I felt like I'd let everyone down. And, and can, you, can you see how that little thing in my mind, you know, something wasn't quite there, you know. I got the chance to fight um, Manny Pacquiao again for the pound for pound number one title. And was, obviously when the Pacquiao fight came along, I got destroyed in, in two rounds. And then my confidence was down, my head was down. Ultimately, I had to retire then. So I think, oh, I'm going to have to hang the gloves up now. I'm going to have to hang the gloves up. If I had have took my own life, because I used, I used to come in here in this very house and sit on that on that couch and I'd be on my own, do you know what I mean? And people say, well, don't go to the pub and have a drink. I've seen, I didn't have to go to the pub and have a drink. I'd come home from the gym, train me lads, tell a few jokes, crack a few smiles, come home on the surface, Rick's all right, and then I'd come in here and I'd just cry. Cry all day, I'd cry all day and... It's pretty just the same routine every day. And then sometimes, you know, I'd, I'd come in and I'd get a knife out and just sit there with it at my me, at me wrist and just crying and crying and crying and I'd be going, come on, come on. Boom, we're on. Today's guest, we've got legendary yeah, boxer, see you, mate. Ricky Hatton. Good, Good to see you, brother. Yeah, we're doing good, mate. Yeah, and good, Nick. Uh, for a change, Ricky Fatton's disappeared for a bit. Um, as I've got uh, an exhibition match, July 2nd. But uh, loving life, doing well, enjoying myself. Yeah, never been happier. You're looking well. You're looking great, in fact. New fight coming up, new challenge. So that's what it's all about. It was uh, 2nd of July, the fight? 2nd of July, yeah. At uh, my second home, Manchester Arena. I had that many fights there. I don't know, back in the day that I could have... Uh, <clears throat> could have probably moved my bed in there to be honest at one point but no um i enjoyed it you know i was approached you know there, there was one exhibition done the first one was done a few years ago now before lockdown i think with um roy jones and mike tyson and after that the obviously the obvious question was if that come about would you do it ricky and that was a few years ago and i said yeah yeah i said you know if it was the right fight you know and the right people put a, put a, the right show on i said yeah and i'd be up for that then I got the phone call about, you know, five months ago saying, would you like to have one last move around? COVID's been a terrible time for everyone, you know what I mean? Everyone with mental health, people have had COVID. Um, would you like to um, do one last dance at the Manchester Arena, if you like, you know, against Marco Antonio Barrera? And I thought, well, I mean, I've, I'd, I've lost people with COVID like I'm sure we all have. And I've lost friends to mental health during the, the COVID. I've lost family to mental health during the COVID. And they said, well... But well, we can do it as like a concert type thing, as like a celebration of coming out of it. So uh, I didn't have to think twice, yeah. How are you feeling about fighting Barrera? <clears throat> um, I'm looking, I can't wait because he's uh, he's been a friend of mine for forever and a day. And we all know how good um, a champion he was and a, a, a fighter he, he was. But I think I'm going to get the, even though he's my friend, I'm going to get the benefits of um, finding out you know, first and just how good he, he actually uh, he actually was, and I, I like the fact that because we are friends, uh, even though it's an exhibition and it'll be competitive. Because I mean, I'm I'm not having him come to Manchester and make me look an idiot, <laughs> and I think he won't want he won't want to come to Manchester mm -hmm. and me do other the same. So that's where the competitive comes in. But I think because we're mates and friends and that, we'll know when to push it and where how you know there've yeah. been all liberties taken and. It, and they think that that would be that's the good thing. Because I think when your heroes are make a comeback, we always worry about them getting knocked out and getting hurt. And my bet my best days are behind me. But uh, bigger gloves, you know, less rounds, shorter rounds against somebody that I know. I think there's nothing negative that can come out of this. I can't I really can't wait. Where do people get the tickets, Ricky? They can get them on Hattonbarera.com, Um, you know, on the internet. It's going to be. Um, 
it's and it's going to be um not like a traditional boxing show they've got live music acts on you know so they'll have a live music act on and then you know a fight will come on and then they'll have another then they'll have a dj come on and then they'll have um i think there's two ufc hall of famers fighting each other and then they'll then they'll have another singer on and then and it, it's more of like a more party it's a laugh more of a mm. you know a celebration coming out of covid because i mean it has been a very very tough time so i think um yeah, it's more of a party theme to it rather than a than a standout boxing yeah. show. So it's gonna be it's gonna be good. Yeah. yeah, good man. Looking forward to it. Yeah, always go back to the start of my guest, Ricky. Where you grew up, and how it all began. I was born on the council estate, <clears throat> just outside of Manchester, Hattersley, which incidentally is only um, ten minutes down the road from from where I live. I've always been homegrown lad, and never really, as well as I did, I don't never really wanted to move, you know, too far afield. And um, the council estate wasn't uh, known for too many good things, to be honest with you. There was the Moors murderers, you know, years years ago, Mara Hindley and Liam Brady, and then the um, Howard Shipman's ten minutes down the down the road. His surgery was ten minutes down the road, and them two police officers, them two lady police officers, got shot here a few year a few years back. So it's, it's from an area that has had too much to uh, sing about in the last few years. But I'd like to think. When they mentioned Hattersley, they might mention a little fat boxer called Ricky Hatton that brought a bit of good back to the area. But uh, I never, I consider myself a Hattersley lad. You know, I, I was from Manchester, which is where I am from. But I mean, uh, ultimately, I'm a Hattersley lad, yeah. And yeah. Um, I've never forgot my roots. And I still, still go down. I have the same mates from school that I always had. Uh, I live 10 minutes down the road from where I was born. And I, um, I think that's why people like me i think you know not just because of me boxing because of the other what i've managed mm. to keep me on keep my feet on the ground a bit what were you like at school ricky terrible <laughs> yeah <laughs> absolutely terrible but some of the teachers and some of the old teachers i still see them knocking about the um about the, the estate and like that and they, they always say ricky you know you you were never no trouble at school you never got involved in a fight you never got involved in anything you just didn't do anything <laughs> you know what i mean mm. it just and i was uh the attitude i had at the time the the teacher used to say to me you know listen you got to do this do your homework where's your homework concentrate you know work hard and i used i'm no i'm going to be a boxer i'm going to be a boxer and now i'm um i'm a father and a grandfather i won't be passing that same advice on to me <laughs> to me to yeah. the to the kids you know what i mean you know because you've got to have you know if i hadn't have done well at the boxing I might, I'd have been in, I'd have been in big trouble. But uh, I always <clears throat> believed I was going to be a boxer from a young age. But no, I wasn't very good at school. Never a troublemaker, but just, just bone idle. What was the first age you put on the gloves? Uh, when I actually, <clears throat> excuse me, I actually did kickboxing when I was, um, I was about eight years old, I think. I was into the as a, a youngster, I was into the Bruce Lee films. Uh, and as I started watching the Bruce Lee's films, I said to my dad, I said, Dad, I'd like to go to like, try karate or kickboxing or something like that. So I went down to the local kickboxing club. Um, and it basically started from there. And I've always been <clears throat> a little short and stocky type. So um, I was good with my fists, but with me being short, not too good with my feet, you know. So as I was trying to get close with my fists to... To to do what well, to do me damage or do what I was good at was I was getting my teeth kicked in basically, <laughs> you know because of the distance I was going away height and reach and I couldn't get near him because we were kicking them. They said, "Why don't you go and try boxing, Ricky? It might be a little bit more suited to you." So I went over the road to the boxing gym, um, in Hyde, and it started from there. Yeah. Did you fall in love with boxing straight away, or were you always was you wary of it? Well, I, I did love boxing straight away. I mean, when I was kickboxing, the first time, I think we kickboxing or, or most certainly boxing, the first time you get hit on the nose, you either go, whoa, that's not for me, or oh, I like that. And funny enough, I liked it. You know, the first time I got cracked on the nose, I was like, you know, or the first time I had a bad spa where somebody had outboxed me or picked me off, you know what I mean? I'd, I'd, I'd come home proper pissed off and I'd be like, you know, can't wait to get back to training on Friday. Can't wait to get back to training on Friday. I'm going to put that right. I'm going to put this right. I'll show him. I'm going to show him on Friday again. And that was, was that's, I think that's the attitude I think old boxers need to need to have from a very from a very young age. You know, I didn't think, oh, that hurt. I think I'm going to go back and I'm going to get it right and I'm going to make sure that's, I sort that kid I sparred out with. I'm going to sort him out on Friday, you know. And, mm. and I think that's... Um, I think it's it's quite simple boxing. You either love it or you hate it. Let's have it right. I mean, to 
to do something for a living where you get punched in the face, you've got to have, a, you, you, there's got to be something wrong with you. <laughs> but yeah. uh, I think that's, I think that's, I think most fighters would probably say that you have a tech to it, you don't. And it's a very addictive um, sport, really, you know, because I mean, when you, you work hard, you train hard, and then when you get your victory, you share it, you get all that. It sounds a bit selfish, but you get all that praise on your own. Mm -hmm. You don't share it with 10 teammates or a manager or anything like that. You know what I mean? It's, you know, you get your hand raised and it's you in that ring on your own and it's such a wonderful feeling. And I think that's why, which I think we'll get to in a bit further down the line, I struggled with retirement, you know, having that, that feeling once it's gone, once you've experienced it and it's gone, it's very, very hard to move yeah. on. Did you have any fighters in your family? My brother Matthew, um, he went professional. He um, he didn't, unlike me, he didn't have a very successful uh, amateur career. He didn't have a handful of fights, but he saw how well I was doing at it, and he thought, you know, I'm, I'm carpet fitting. I'm on my hands and knees all day, you know, getting getting paid, you know, just a few quid and everything like that. I might as well give it a go, doing something that I love. And he turned professional. Um, he lost a couple of six rounders along the way. I think he got disqualified in an eight rounder, but he stayed at it. Stayed at it. And he uh, became the European champion. I think he made about four defences. And he actually went the distance with, uh, if off the world title, went the distance with um, um, Canelo Alvarez, which was the number one, uh, who was until recently, he's recently been one of the best pound for pound, number one pound for pound fighter uh, in the world. So mm -hmm. he was, um, so he did well, Matthew, in his uh, own right, when he really wasn't expected to. He, he went professional as well. Look at Ricky Atten's brother here, but he didn't. He made his own name in his own right. And I think uh, some great fighters there. Not many went from the distance yeah. for Saul Alvarez, did they? So that speaks volumes to what Matthew achieved in the game. Do you think there was a lot of pressure on Matthew to succeed very because much of so. your success? Yeah, very much so. You know what I mean? Because, I mean, you always get the you know, the finger pointed. He won't be as good as his brother. And he always, always just, just trying to follow in his brother's footsteps or jump on the bandwagon. Campbell's in the same, same position. And just like... Um, my son Campbell, who's gone professional, but just like Matthew was in the same position with a lot of pro a lot of pressure and you know um, um, pressure on his shoulders and a lot of people pointing the finger. Ultimately, you know, he did, did the business, didn't he? And we, me and Matthew firmly believe Campbell will do the same, mm -hmm. given time, obviously. What was your first <clears> fight like, Ricky? My first fight, uh, my first amateur fight was, um, as you can imagine, um, pretty brutal. You know, toe to toe. I fought a guy called Danny Reynolds from Leeds, who uh, I did fight further down the line about four years after. Um, but yeah, it was a very, very close, um, close fight. You, uh, majority, majority decision, split decision. But uh, it was an absolute war, and I think that was from the start. They were, you know, we just well, we went to toe to toe like two professionals. You know, like you, you would see in a professional fight, not an amateur fight. And I think right away people could see me, me talent, but see that was uh, probably mm, more suited to the professional side of the game mm. rather than me because I used to come out, I used to slip and roll and throw body punches, and and that was from eleven years of age. So I think um, the writing, the, the, I mean, not the writing on the wall, the, the signs were there from from day one. And you just loved it from that moment getting hit and. The bloody noses. And... Loved it. It's not just the, the you know they they get they getting hit. You either when you get hit, you either love it or you don't, and then you decide to you know it's not for me. I've had loads of friends that said give it a try. They said first time I got hit, I they thought oh, stop, <laughs> sod that. no no chance. But you know I think most fight but fighters would say that they they've gone on to do the boxing. They've said they, they loved it. But yeah, I uh, but it's the training. I think most people. I think certainly when you're an amateur boxer. I think whether you have one fight or 101 fights, I think so many people have become better people because they've had a go at, at mm -hmm. it because it's that type of sport, isn't it? You know, there's how many um, delinquents or people or, you know, kids or youngsters going down the wrong the wrong path have got into boxing, gone in the gym, they've learnt the discipline and the respect and, the, you know, and the fitness and conditioning and the, that side of the, the boxing game. And they might not have gone on and become a world... Um, a world champion because we all want to produce world champions but in amateur boxing it's I think once you've had a go and gone in the ring and gone in the boxing gym and sparred and and, and got used to the boxing what comes with the boxing I think uh, I think you end up make, yeah, end up makes, makes you a better yeah. person who, who did you look up to when you were a kid as a boxer 
Who did I look up to? Um, yeah, I used to, to like I used to like Nigel Ben when I first started getting into boxing. Um, Nigel Ben was uh, like in Chris Eubank, and I was about I was about fifteen years of age. I used to watch Nigel on the TV, and <clears throat> he's dead aggressive, dead ferocious. Went for the knockout, no nonsense. And you know, I saw myself as a youngster, like you know, I was a bit of an idiot. <laughs> Not an idiot, Nigel. Sorry, I mean, I was a bit, I was a bit of a no old bard, you know, mm -hmm. you know, never say die, you know, dead aggressive, you know. I was like that as an amateur, and I thought, oh my god, it's me, do you know what I mean? And it was like, but it, not only was it me, but I thought, look at look what he's done, world champion. Look at the size of the crowds, you know, and look at his nice car, and look at this, and look at that. Oh, I want to be like Nigel. Uh, and style wise, we were right up each other's street, but you know, obviously, that's that's why I wanted to be what he was a, a world champion. And uh, but then, as I, as I got into the boxing more, you know, through watching Nigel, I started becoming a bit more of a student where I get the old videos out where I watch the champions of yesteryears and the old fighters. And uh, my favorite fighter of all time then became Roberto Duran, uh, he became my greatest fighter. Nigel got me into boxing, he was my favorite. You know, as I got in, and then when I got into the start studying the sport a bit more, um, I fell in love with Roberto Duran. His style, his attitude, what he, what he did for his people, just just the the, the whole shebang. And I think there's a little bit of similarities. It's like you know, I'm I'm all for my people. You never see me. I'm always banging the drum for Manchester. I'm always thanking my fans and like that. And there's a little bit of me. There's a little bit. Of, that's what Duran was like to the Panama people. What age did you turn professional, Ricky? 18. So Why so young? I just, I didn't, um, I think I boxed in the World Juniors and I got a bronze medal. So I think I would have been picked for the Olympics um, because I'd, I'd obviously, well, because I got my bronze medal in the World Juniors, I think I would have been picked for the Olympics. But the Olympics was 12 months after I boxed in the World Juniors. I was 17. Um got boxed in the World Juniors and then the, um, the Olympics come up and then, as soon as the Olympics run, three months after, I became 18. So for me, if I wanted to go to the Olympics, I'd have had to wait four years till the next Olympics, you know. So uh, I thought, okay, I don't want to wait four years to go to the Olympics. I thought, you know, I'll, I'll turn professional. And to be honest with you, I was training with the professionals from 16 years of age. I was going down the Brian Hughes gym in Collier's, Brian Hughes, uh, Collier's to Moston gym, training with Brian Hughes and Pat Barrett. And then I went up to Billy Graham's Phoenix camp in Salford where I was training with world champion Cal Thompson, Enzi Bingham, Steve the Viking Foster, all the present champions. Um, and I was training with them from a 16-year-old when I left school and stuff like that. So I always... Um, so I always... Um, uh, I always pretty much... I think, I think I wanted to be a professional, as I mentioned earlier, with watching Nigel and looking up to Nigel Ben on the TV and then going training with the pros, even though I was still uh, an amateur. Um, I think I was always going to go professional anyway. So what was your first professional like, your fight like, Ricky? First professional fight, it was... Uh, needless to say, I couldn't wait. I always dreamt of becoming a professional um, fighter. Um and yeah, I mean, I was obviously nervous for it, but not as nervous as what you probably think because I, I was, I, the one thing I always had, I've never, when people think of Ricky Hatton, they'll probably think of not, not you know, not an arrogant person, a down to earth feet on the ground, you know, doesn't slag an opponent off, not a big mouth or anything like that, which is very rare in boxing, certainly these days. But um, no, but I, but my, my, my best attribute was my self-belief and how, you know, me, and confidence in my own ability. So even though I was nervous when we pulled debut, it was like, I can't I bring it on, I can't wait. And I won first round knockout against Kid McCauley uh, with Nurse Leisure Centre, 1997, a few years ago now that. <laughs> but uh, no, it was brilliant. And I mean, I was working with uh, the professional champions every day and it was hard, as hard as a game boxing was. It started off as me, uh, me hobby. You know what I mean? And then eventually I'm getting now paid <laughs> for doing my hobby. So it sounds as, as it's the hardest game in the world, boxing, but I thought really blessed. You know what I mean? That was, you know, getting paid for doing something that I, that I loved and going to the gym every day and training with British champions, European champions, world champions and learning and picking their brains and everything like that. It was, uh, you know, the start of my career when I went professional and it was, it was happy time. It was a dream, happy times. Did you see the vision? how successful you would become or was it 
a steady process. Like as soon as you turn pro, did you know you're going to be one of the greatest? Well, I uh, Billy Graham um, told me. He said, you know, he said you're the best fighter I've ever worked with, and Billy Graham was the trainer of world champions. You know, he did. You know. Cal Thompson, the Bingham, Steve the Viking, Foster, Paul Burt was a come over champion. Andy Oligan fought for the world title. He did trained champions. So when when a trainer of champions says to you, "You're the best I've ever trained," do you know what I mean? He says, and if you dedicate yourself and you work hard at the game and you tick all the other boxes, because don't forget, I was still a youngster. I still had boxes to tick. Like you had to prove your heart, your chin, your stamina. You know, there's all these, you know, and that's. Pretty much in every sport, really, you can have the potential, but the potential is only the the, the, the start. You've got to have the other things and the other yeah. aspects. So, but he said, if you've got all them, he said, you know, and all the other champions. Cal Thompson was the world cruiserweight champion. He was in them brilliant fights with Chris Eubank. If you remember at the Manchester mm -hmm. Arena, he was saying to me, "You're going to go all the way, you, and we're going to work hard with you. And make sure you get you get there and all that." And it was when people like that are saying that to you, you think. Gee, I've got, I must have half a chance yeah. here, you know, if I've got it, if I can do it. And, and like, like I mentioned earlier, having the self belief in my own ability, I, I, I pretty, pretty much, I said when I was 18, I said, I want to be a world champion. And I said, if I, with my ability and what people are telling me, if I don't, I've failed. So I've got to want it more. And that was my attitude at yeah. 18. Because you like, guys like yourself, Chris Eubank, Nigel Benn, Steve Collins, Joe Kozagi, Prince Nazim, like, you were in many Prince Nazim's undercard. Like, he was one of the greatest as well. Like, what was that feeling like? Obviously, you're moving through the ranks. It was brilliant. Frank Warren, I signed with Frank Warren at the time and he promoted Prince Nassim Hamad and he was the biggest name in British boxing. I mean, so as I mentioned earlier, my professional debut was at Witness Leisure Centre. So he had to fight on the um, on the on the local shows, you know, on the, the, the Leisure Centre shows and stuff like that, which was which is great learning experience. And then the next, you know, the couple of months after I'd be boxing at Madison Square Garden, you know, when Nassim Ahmed boxed Kevin Kelly. Uh, and now that now that's experience. You got to get experience to the local shows and the you know the the small hall shows, and you don't get bigger than Madison Square Garden. So you can imagine for an eighteen year old, you know, to be you know doing there and fighting here and fighting there and fighting there and Nassim Ahmed's undercard, and I was able to see how you know what it's like when you fight on a world title bill. You know, like the way in the build up, the interviews and everything like that. And for me to you know just sit in the background and watch Naz and see how he. Uh, prepared not just not just for what he's going to do when he got in the ring you know just what what comes with the world title fight it was it was great experience for me to sit down and watch and learn what was he like to watch as a fighter he was unbelievable naz to be honest with you he was um God, what a power puncher he had legs on him and the leverage you could get you know and the, the, he, i loved watching Naz because um he always went for the knockout. He always wanted to do damage. And I don't think I'm an aggressive person. As a my character is aggressive, but as a as a boxer, I was a I was a nasty little I was a nasty little <laughs> fucker. I was no, I was a nasty little fucker. I really wanted to hurt my opponents. Not not mm -hmm. permanently, but you know, when I was in that ring, I wanted to really hurt my opponents. And Naz used to live for the knockout. You know, big, massive, explosive knockouts. So I absolutely um, uh, loved Naz. Uh, ironically, you know, Naz, who's so on a box on the undercards, looked up to, but the the gentleman that put pay to his career in the end was Marco Antonio Barrera. I'm doing the exhibition yeah, with, yeah, yeah. on the 2nd of July. So uh, I hope he doesn't, Marco, don't do to Naz what you don't do to me, <laughs> what you did to Naz. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, how do you make that for being the people's champion? Everybody loves you and adores you, like to then having that killer instinct in the ring. How do you make that switch? Uh, it just they're very easy, you know. I mean, what I was in the ring and what I was out of the ring was uh, two different things, and I think there's a lot of people. I mean, we all have our own different personalities, but when that bell goes, you know, some people, you know, you've got to, you've got to, whatever you are as a person or whatever you are in the gym, you know, when you go to fight I and mean, you know you. Your livelihood's on the line, you know what I mean? You, it's, it's how we make our living, you know what I mean? It's how I provide for my kids and that. So when the bell, when I used to look at my opponent and think to myself, you're in the way of making a better life for myself. You're in the way of, you're taking, you are taking, literally taking money out of my kids' mouths, you. And that's what I used to, that's what I always used to think before the first bell goes. So you can imagine I wanted to kill them. Yeah. Not literally, obviously. Yeah. But that's, that's what I was like. But then when I come out of the gym, people like me because, you know, 
I go to the pub and have a pint. I play for my local darts team. Do you know what I mean? You know, I, I still play for the vets on, on Sunday for my local pub mm. on the estate there with the Sunday vets over 40s. I still play for that. And um, I go stand in the stand and watch Man City. You know what I mean? I'll be there with a bob rolling and a pie. You know what I mean? And people used to say, well, world champion. Do you look at Ricky there? <laughs> 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 him, you know, and, and it's like, but it was... It wasn't, it wasn't, people liked me because it wasn't an act. They could see, you know, mm. you, you, the public, you know, I, I was no different, I'm no different to, to the people that come supporting me. Mm. And I think, I think they could see it. And I think that's why they, they like me. They're all listening, but local lad, Ricky, out and done well, feet on the floor. He's a character and he laugh a minute. Look at him, size of him, the fat fucker. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah, hey, let's go and watch him. And it, there was that sort of like feel to it. And, mm. and obviously, what I did when when the bell went, I'm sure people enjoyed as well. But but I think that's why people like me. Was that to try and make yourself one of the boys as well, one of the lads to be? Then obviously you've got the the professionalism of being a fighter and the the, the eight weeks, ten weeks, twelve week camp. Sometimes your camps are fourteen weeks. Like see after a camp and after a victory, is it just let loose and try and come back into a bit of normality? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean that was half the problem. I say to my fighters now, and I'm, I'm my son Campbell, who's gone professional. I say, do you know? Do do as I say, not as I do, <laughs> and that was. Um, but when I was doing my six rounders, and my, you know, I was coming up through the through the through the rankings, um, I was in the gym all the time. You know, there's this reputation, Ricky Fatten, that I got. You know, for being a bit, of, you know, living life on the wild side a little bit and everything like that. But I, when I was just coming through the the, the ranks, uh, I, I lived in the gym. I'd only have like an odd an odd night a night off and then I'd be back in training and you know my first year I had nine fights in 12 months that's a fight every six weeks so you know there wasn't no time to be to be unwinding but it's when I got to like champ world title level where you have say three fights in a year where there's bigger gaps in between that's when I could have maybe showed a, a little bit more discipline but I something was something that always attracted me to go and see my mates and go into the pub and that because I have a little bit of, um, I do have a lot of confidence, believe it or not. I have confidence in my own self-belief, but I do have a lack a little bit of confidence in my own, my own as a person. And I used to think, you know, when I was boxing on Sky TV and I was boxing and people were seeing me and, you know, you know, signing autographs and having pictures and everything like that. And I, sometimes I'd go like months without seeing my mates, weeks without seeing my mates. And something in my head, paranoia in the back of my head used to say, I hope they don't think I'm getting too big for my boots and too above my station. I hope they don't think I forgot about them and I've changed. I hope they don't think I've changed. So I'd find myself nipping down, just nipping down at the pub to see him. You know, hey, lads, you okay? And that's a, that's a bit of, um, and I think that was the early signs of my mental health. That's a bit of sign of weakness, you know what I mean? You know, instead of getting on thinking, oh, my mate, mates aren't bothered. They're loving what I'm doing. They're proud of me. Mm -hmm. In my own mind, I used to think, no, 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 no. I've got to go down there and see him. I've got to go down there and see him. And then um, ultimately, when, when I, my first defeat came against Floyd Mayweather, I felt like I'd let everyone down. And, and can, you, can you see how that little thing in my mind, you know, something wasn't quite there, you know. My mates would go, don't worry about coming down seeing us. We're proud of you. We love you, Rick. We're proud of you. You know, Ricky, you got beat by Mayweather. No, Rick, God blame me. It's Floyd Mayweather. What do you want? But in my mind, my head was falling mm -hmm. off, you know, and... And that was that was the start of that side of my life. You know, the boxing was was going great, but there was a there was just a little little fella on my shoulder that was a, that you know I couldn't I couldn't get off. You know, was a loneliness kicked in at times, Ricky? Um, not really. I think I was very very. The family was very very close at the time. We're very very close now. But I mean, there was a period with my family where it went a little bit you know haywire. But um, but no, I. Um, you know, I, I I used to have a, you know good friends that would come round. I had good family that would come round and and see me. And then when I got to, in relationship when my kids come along and everything like that, I was with my my ex partner for 12, 13, 13 years. So uh, no, it wasn't um, it wasn't a loneliness. No, because I speak to a lot of successful people and it is a lonely journey to be successful. But you obviously is trying to find the balance. Like, do you think that was a hindrance as well? That. It's not your people pleasing, but to try and fit in with other people so they think you're not better than them instead of just 100% focused on your journey to be the greatest of all time. Yeah, that's what it was. I mean, um, and, you know, it shouldn't, you know, you've got to you got to be really, with your boxing career, you know, you've got to be really, or with any career, you've got to be selfish. 
and you got to think, listen, that's my job. I've got a job to do. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, I mean, you've got to you've got to concentrate on your on your job. And I I always I always had one one. I was always concentrating on my job, but I always had one you know one eye on you know shut it off. I don't want people thinking this. Don't be this because. And I sort of like go out into Manchester or into town or wherever we'd we'd go, and you did, you know, people saying, um, you know, and my mates and, and people around you would say him, oh, I've seen him and met him a few times, what a dickhead he is, oh, what an honourable person he is, oh, absolutely, you know, and I think to myself, Are these people saying it about me, do you know what I mean? Like, you know, did they did they think I'm arrogant? They think I'm cocky and like that. So he was like, you know, when I was world champion, never walked to the front of a queue, never. You know, never. It's just I was always I was. You'd, you'd think I was I was shy. I was always life and soul of the party. But you know, when it come to that, you'd think I was shy. It's because I was paranoid that I mean, I I, I wouldn't want the belts if people thought what's the point of being the best in the world if everyone thinks you're a dickhead yeah. and you're walking down the street and everyone's thinking there's that Ricky out there. There's that what life's that? Even mm -hmm. if you've got belts and money and what comes of it. So, and that was a big big part of mine certainly early on it, there was something still there that was that wasn't that wasn't doing me any favors yeah. what was it like winning your first world title well the first world title was was, was brilliant i won um you know to win any world title you know you can imagine it's such a when you start off at the council estate you dream of becoming a world champion like we said earlier and nigel ben and then to to do it it's you know, and they say, and the new like welterweight champion of the world. It's a dream you, you never ever wake wake up from. And um, but you know, I mean, once I won my world title, you know, beat Tony Pep with a first round knockout. Tony Pep actually three fights before had gone the distance with Floyd Mayweather Junior. So I mean, uh, just to win the belt and do it in the manner I did it, it was it was absolutely brilliant. You know, my first ever world title, and then you set yourself. The goals, you know, I've, now I've been a world champion, I want to stay a world champion and I want to win more world titles because there's, in boxing these days, there's four or five versions of the world titles and I was thinking it was now I've become a world champion, my next goal was to try and become the best in my weight division mm -hmm. out of all the champions, if you like. So obviously you've got the little, the wires are kind of going about, not, not realising the extent of, like, not the self-sabotage, but trying to fit in and please your friends while you're trying to be a world champion. Like, how then, when you win the world title, Ricky, does the pressure come? The limelight, the fame, the money? Like, I think, were you not still staying with your parents? I was still staying with my parents, so I think that helped. Uh -huh. I think that helped um, a lot. But then, obviously, as I started, um, you know, my, my, my money started increasing then, you know, and I, I was thinking to myself, it's, it's about time I, um, <laughs> it's about time I moved out of the box room now, I'm world champion, you know, I've got a few quid here, you know, but, and I did, and I moved, and he only moved down the road. In fact, Matthew lives there now, my brother, uh, in the in the same house that I used to, to to live at. And I was still like, you know, in the same town as my mum and dad, so I could still go around there. My mum would still do me, me diet and my food for me. You know, I, I had it made, you know what I mean? There, mum, there's 30 quid, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I had it, I had it, uh, I had it made. Um yeah, and then you know, and then you know, sort of like then getting your fights, looking after your money, and 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 everything like that. And obviously, the house that I, I live in, you know, today was the house I always dreamed of. But I mean, normally you'd have to move further afield out of Manchester in order to, you know, to you know to get that. And I I didn't want to move away from not only my family and me, me kids, me girl, you know, me, me kids live around here, my grandkids now, and my mum and my dad and my brother and my friends and Campbell lives around here now. So I never really wanted to, um, really wanted to venture. And, and normally to have a, have, have a house like this, you'd have to do that. But I just bided my time, you know, just, you know, stayed in the box room, just stayed in a little, you know, a little smaller house, with a beautiful house, but I mean, just stayed there. And I just waited till this, this come on, you know, and that's, but I've always been, a, I've always been a homeboy, always been a hometown boy, you know. How do you think you would have been, Ricky, if you never done boxing at that age in your twenties? Do you think you'd have just been, 95 and the boozers yeah i uh, i don't I, you know i um i don't think i'd have been you know people say oh if i hadn't have found boxing i'd have gone into robbing and stealing and this and that and all the rest of it and i'd have been a criminal or i'd have gone to prison i don't think it'd have been like that i'd have think i'd have just gone into the family business and i'd have been a carpet fitter because before they went professional i was a carpet fitter did a bit part-time car bit fitting for me dad a little bit here and there to get myself a few quid to put petrol in the car so I could go to Salford and train with the professionals and 
you know, a few quid so I could pay me board just you know, from leaving school. And I think that's what I'd have, uh, I'd have done. I'd have been not judging anybody that does that, you know, but I mean, I'd have just had a, I'd have had a nine to five, I'd have been a carpet fitter, I'd have got me wages, I'd have paid me rent and I'd have, you know, I'd have been in the pub every yeah. night. Was there any telltale signs then when you won your world title that there's maybe excessive drinking or was it kind of, not sugar-coated, but it was unseen because you were world champion, you were looking great, like it was kind of went under the radar or did anybody ever say look Ricky man you've got your whole future ahead of you just wait no I never I never hid never hid me drinking from from anyone still never hid me me me, me drinking I um I you know I think I'm mean, like most people probably drink a little bit more than what we uh what we what we should do but um when I had big gaps I mean it was I had big gaps in between me fight you know I'd, I'd train for like 12 or 14 weeks then I'd have like say maybe 10 weeks off and it was like you know being young and having money and everything like that it wasn't necessarily the drinking it was just the drinking and going out in general and you know it was and although I wasn't arrogant you know when people were like hey Ricky come in I, there's a table yeah I do I drink that's on us you know it's it's not that you're arrogant it, it, you know it, it's nice and it was nice to go out and stuff like that, but um, I think it was. Um, and when I was winning, it was it was when I was winning, defending my titles and, and making a living and everything like that. It was great. But then when things started going wrong, was when defeat started, you know, you know, kicking in here. Yeah. Did you feel untouchable? It certainly, must have felt untouchable. With like going <clears throat> thirty and all, thirty eight and all that flying high in life beating everybody that well when i um from a boxing point of view when i was when i beat costa zoo when um i fought for the universally undisputed title which which meant i become not only a world champion the best in my weight division and um, costa zoo was actually number number one pound for pound in any weight division and he come to manchester to fight me and i was a massive underdog nobody expected me to um to beat him you know in fact everybody was uh everyone was dead excited and all behind me manchester arena you know what i mean a man union fighting costa zoo at the manchester arena you can imagine it was like that but there was a nervousness because i think everyone thought come on ricky you know we want you to do it but i think a lot a lot even the ones that were behind me thought oh shit this is this could go a bit pear-shaped but um but no i ended up winning it i made him quit on his stool and it you know it probably Manchester's greatest ever boxing night and it said if I'd have won it would go down as one of the best wins ever in a British boxing ring and that's where it stay and he was such a formidable champion because he was knocking everybody out such a hard right hand punch he was blasting everyone out and everyone was scared to death for me but I ended up beating him and um and uh, I, I sort of like beat him at his own game. I went straight at him, stayed on his chest and bullied him a little bit. And he ended up quitting on his stool. So from a boxing point of view, um, I thought, yeah, I thought, oh, I can't be touched now. If I can walk through him, I can walk through anyone. And didn't, and that's how I went on into my next, uh, my next, next few fights. But no, I, I even when I um, won the world title and beat Costa Zoo, I still remained, um, and, you know, when you said earlier about being untouchable, um, no, I think the, the greatest thing is what my parents brought me up to always be humble, feet on the ground, and I always and I've, since from from all the way through, I think I've always been that way. Do you think that's why you get the support that you got and the love that yeah. you got is because you massively, were just a fucking massively, good guy, yeah, yeah, just yeah. one of the boys, and people could see yeah, yeah. a bit of their self in you, yeah, except well, you've just succeeded to everything you set out to succeed. At. Yeah. Absolutely, I think that that's exactly what it is. I think people from the Hattersley Council Estate, where I was born, when they see me winning world titles and they see me coming out the ring and go, "Thanks for everyone who's been there all the way from the start. Thank you for the fans for paying to come in and support me. Thanks for all that." I'm telling you, them people in Hattersley be like, "What, what lad? He'll be in here next week, and all him. He won't be. He won't be on the red carpets. He'll be in here." But Mr. Floyd Mayweather, for example, who comes from Michigan, and the same, they call them projects in America, don't they? Yeah. Or the same sort of like, like thing. I don't think the people in Michigan, when Floyd Mayweather wins his belt and goes, look at me watch, look at me this, look at me that, whoa. No, they'll be thinking it's a toss <laughs> Because, you know, but no, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, when you come from the council estate, I've always remained humble, never forgot the fans, I never forgot the people that were there from day one. Where Floyd's forgot them, look at me watch, look at me this, look at me that. And I think people in Michigan will be sat there now thinking, what a dick he is. Yeah. 
And that's 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 the difference. You know, Floyd will go down as the greatest of all time. He's got money, you know, going out of his ears. But I'd rather have the love I have from my fans than the love that he will have from the peaceful people of Michigan, yeah. seeing what he's turned into. Did you feel an added pressure, though, to be as humble as you were, to try and... Not for, and it's not no, yeah, because that's what I, that's yeah. what I was saying to you earlier about. That's why I felt like I had to, <clears throat> I had to thank him. I had to go back because that was a point of me where I thought, you know, if I, people thought, look how look at him, Charlie, big, you know, you know, wow. it, it'd kill me, and that's why I, um, I always remained because I mean that's the way my parents brought me up. It wasn't, it, I wasn't putting anything on. I was not trying to be something I wasn't. It's something I was, but I always, the you know, the the best thing is when I go. For the for a pint on on the council estate, walk in the pub, and kids come up to me from the estate. Hey, Ricky, how you doing? That's that's what it's all about. It's yeah, all it's about worth yeah. more than gold, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. So you went to America. You were undefeated. You fought, like you said, they're the greatest of all time. Some people will argue that he's not, but for me personally, as for everything he has conquered to be have that record. So when you're going over to America, I think I don't know if it was Frank Bruno. It took the most British there. I think it was maybe ten thousand against Mike Tyson. But when you've went, you've 35, 40,000 people. That it's just unbelievable to even have in a stadium in the UK, never mind America. Like, what? How did that fight come about with you and Floyd Mayweather? Well, I beat Costa Zoo, which it was such a massive, massive upset, upset and the manner in which I did it. <clears throat> and then I um, become a, a world champion in two weight divisions. I won the, the welterweight title against Louis Calazzo when I, <clears throat> when I boxed in Boston, when I, when I, I boxed Louis. Uh, and then I went to Las Vegas, won another world title, like well to win IBF title against Juan Urango in my Vegas debut, which was fantastic. Seeing your name up in lights for years, watching Leonard Hagler, Hearns, Tyson, mm -hmm. and all them on the strip. Then your little fat face comes up. It's <laughs> something you'll never, uh, something you'd, you'd never think is ever going to happen. <clears throat> and then it'd be Jose Luis Castillo in the fourth round, and he'd previously gone. Um, um, 12 round, 12 round distance twice with Floyd Mayweather. You know what I mean. So I beat him in four rounds, and so then that gave me the opportunity to turn around and say, "Well, you know, Floyd's the best. I want to be the best. But you know, we would you have a watch? You know, you know. Like I said there was more action in my four rounds than in Floyd's previous 24 with him, and that's what, I'm, and that got the fight then against uh, Floyd Mayweather. And I think it was because he, because we were so different. Do you know what I mean? He was like, as I mentioned earlier, it's all about me watch, all about all, oh, it's not about me performance, don't matter about the fans, it's all about making money, you know what I mean? Well, I was the opposite. I was going, oh, thank you for coming over and supporting me and everything like that. It was like good cop, bad cop, and it made the build up and every just everything just... And I, and I think, you know, the, the, the fact that the 40,000 fans went over and into his backyard to support him it's like it's, even though I look back now I mean at the time when I got beat as I mentioned earlier I got beat by Floyd it hit me very very hard you know I told all these fans I was going to go over there and do it and I didn't and I felt so let down and I couldn't leave the house but embarrassed but when I, now I look back at so much pride when people come up to me on a weekly basis oh Ricky Went to there with Floyd Mayweather. Oh, it was unbelievable. You couldn't move. Couldn't move on the strip of Vegas. They ran out of beers in the bars. Who said we were on the waterfalls. We were singing. Oh, unbelievable, Ricky. And it makes me feel really so, so proud now. And when you think what he's done since, he'll probably go down as arguably the greatest of all yeah. time. I think Muhammad Ali will always have the manner, you know, the... the, the um, the label as the greatest yeah. but i think as far as from boxing and skills and wins and just you know just an all-round you know i think for me yeah. we'll probably go down as the greatest but you should be proud yourself we i watched that in manties and aberdeen all the family stayed up. i think it was like five in the morning because i named my dog i've got a boxer dog and we named my dog after you hatton oh, so we did. <laughs> cheers cheers made, i don't know if that's a compliment yeah, or it's so, made, no. it's made me what dog was it <laughs> a boxer a ball, for God's sake. <laughs> so our dog was called hatton and yeah. we were all up there watching no, it, obviously. It, it was it's one of it's one of the moments i look back at pride now you know, now I now I'd gone through all that 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 stage. You know, with me me my, uh, my personal life and everything like that. Now, I couldn't watch the fight for for forever. I mean, when when I got beat by Mayweather, you know, I, I had sportsmen's dinners booked and appearances and you know this that. And I, I didn't want to do any of them. I cancelled them all. I didn't want to walk down the house. And when I'd walk through my hometown, 
I'd be like, you know, are they laughing at me? Are they laughing at me? Are they laughing at me? And it was, uh, and I think that was when, um, I think it was always there, my mental health, as we mentioned earlier. But I think that just sent it moving on that little bit. Triggered that? Triggered it that little bit more, yeah. Did you realise how good Floyd Mayweather was? Yeah, oh yeah. I mean, when I got in the ring, I mean, I, 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 I was from the first bell, I thought, you know, we're just... I hope the referee he allows me to get close to him. You rocked him the first round, did you not? I caught him. I think he was more off balance. But I think if he'd have hit the if he'd have hit the um if he'd have touched the canvas, it'd have definitely been counted as a knockdown. But I don't know. I think he was more off balance than anything. It was a good start to the fight. But the one thing before the fight was I thought Floyd likes to box at a distance, you know what I mean? Um I like to fight up close. And as long as he lets it fight go at a distance and lets it go close, I think we've got my, got a, a good chance here. And the fact that I was in his backyard of Las Vegas and the referee was from Las Vegas, I was thinking, I hope he lets me at him. And I think from the start of the fight, it was clear that he wasn't going to let me at him. He kept breaking me and breaking me and breaking me. And I sat down on the stool at the end of the second round and I said to Billy, I went, it's happened, Danny, he's not letting me near him. He's breaking me, Billy. I said, no, none of us are holding. None of us are holding. Why am I going to get in and hold? Why, when I get in, I want to hit him. He said, he's breaking, he's breaking. He went, listen, there's nothing we can do. We expected this, we trained for this. Listen, try and keep your composure, blah, 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 blah. And then each round as it went by, my head started going a little bit more, started getting more frustrated. And I was doing all right, you know, in the fight. It wasn't like, you know, the referee wasn't letting me near him and he was pinging me. You know, it was like, I was still doing all right. But bit by bit, my composure went, he took a point off me, said that I hit him behind the head when it missed. And... My head fell off then, and then ultimately, then bit by then, he took me apart, and then he then he knocked me out, and it was, uh, yeah, it was devastating because I think I, uh, I think up to about the halfway mark, there wasn't much in nip, nip and tuck and that, but uh, I, um, I was fighting with so much frustration as the ref, you know, I felt, felt like the referee wasn't really uh, wasn't letting me get at him. How was that then with your first loss? Like you say, you feel as if you're a failure, you've let people down, and in reality, the people who watched know that's not the case, but it's hard for somebody to say that who's also battling with maybe insecurities or the paranoia sets in, like you say, you think people are laughing that. Did your world just shatter after that defeat? Yeah, I felt like packing it in. Um, and I had a long time off. I had a long time to think about it. Yeah, it wasn't good. But then bit by bit, you know, like anything, you start venturing out, you start doing a few more appearances and things like that. And then you start thinking, oh, shall I give it another go? And then I start thinking to myself, listen, Rick, you know I mean? You know, the first time you got beat, I know it's Floyd Mayweather, but I mean, you know, legacies are built on coming back from defeats. You know what I mean? If you've only first, you've had it all your own way, then the first time you've got beat, you chuck the towel in. That's not what champions are about. That's not what champions are made of. So I decided to make a comeback. And um, then I got me another dream of mine to box at the City of Manchester Stadium. Being a Man City fan, I always wanted to box at... Man City's ground, it was main road years ago and um, it was the Etihad, so I got the chance to box there at um, the Etihad um, Stadium. 60,000 fans turned up and that was 60,000 fans was sold out in about three weeks. Uh, so, and it, it sort of like, you know, give me the confidence, you know what, you were right to come back. You know, if you'd mm. have packed the game in, you wouldn't have tipped this box, boxing at Man City, you said, you know, it, 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 brilliant. I said, you know, it, but it wasn't really my best performance. So the occasion and the, the 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 thing was good, but my performance wasn't great. And I thought to myself, maybe I need uh, maybe I need to th think about whether or maybe a change or something like that. Because Billy Graham was um, very in injury ridden. He was having needles in his hands to get through training sessions, needles in his elbows. And me and Billy uh, decided to uh, to part company. Uh, but he didn't share the same enthusiasm with me, so we, he fell out with me. So Billy Graham, who'd been there from day one. Um, and, and you know, my, my mate was more than a trainer, he was a mate of mine. And all of a sudden, we fell out. So, you know, I got beat by Mayweather, I'm down. Then I boxed at Man City, what a great occasion. Then my performance wasn't great, I was down again. Mm -hmm. And then I was down when uh, me and Billy split up. And then I fought Paulie Malinagi in Las Vegas, and uh, Nolan Liam carried the belts in finally for me. They, were, they were hit two heroes of mine, carried the belts in in Las Vegas and I stopped Malinagi in the 11th round and it was one of my best performances since the Costa Zoo fight. So my frame of mind was back up then. Hmm. And then the manner of the fight, I got the chance to fight um, Manny Pacquiao 
again for the pound for pound number one title and obviously, obviously when the Pacquiao fight came along I got destroyed in, in two rounds and then my confidence was down my head was down ultimately I had to retire then so I think oh, I'm going to have to hang the gloves up now I'm going to have to hang the gloves up and then I fell out with my mum and dad so when, when that happened so you can see me frame of mind I'm up and down I'm up and down up mm. and down then you, you got destroyed by Pacquiao you fell out with your mum and dad you've got to retire so I didn't have my mum and dad to share my retirement with. I didn't have Billy Graham to share my retirement with. I had to retire. I didn't care whether I lived or died at that stage. Yeah. Didn't was, care. Was that for your own self-destruction that you fell out with everyone? No, I uh, totally... Um, I, mean, it's sound, I don't want to say too much because my mum and dad were made up now. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm so glad I didn't set my life because I, I wouldn't have seen Campbell go pro. I wouldn't have made up with my mum and dad. I wouldn't have made... But I think I was at, I think it was that right to fall out with them. Yeah. But, you know, we've, we've moved on for that, you know, we've, we've brought the family back together, which we, we never thought was going to was gonna happen. So, you know, life is, is, is great, you know, again, at the yeah, minute. But I think it, it was, I think it was all, it was all things that were unavoidable. It's, it's just the way I was built, you know, and I mean, obviously I got beat by Mayweather. I can't help feeling the way I did. That's, that's me. And then I boxed at the Man City Stadium. Whoa, yes, buzzing again. yes, buzzing again. And then all of a sudden, you know, I fall out with Billy, back down. Then I give Mal I'll knock out Malinardi and Nolan and Liam carry the belts in in Las Vegas. Oh, yeah. And then, you know, and I think um, knowing how I am and how I was and the problem that I had, uh, I don't think, I think it was unavoidable. I don't think mm -hmm. there's anything I could have done. I think it was always going to, uh, it was always going to happen. What was how much pressure was on you after the Mayweather fight to be fighting in the city ground to be thinking everything's on the line? No pressure now. whatsoever. None at no all. No pressure whatsoever. No, because I mean, by the time I'd fought Floyd Mayweather, I'd had forty-five fights. Mm -hmm. I was WBU champion. I'd made fifteen defenses and my WBU title. And then that's even before you Mayweather, your Pacquiao's, your Malinages, and and you know being how I was how I lived my, you know I was up in weight down in weight up in weight down in weight you know how I lived socially do you know what I mean it takes a toll on your body up in weight down in weight and my, my style of fighting you know I wasn't a master of defence like a Floyd Mayweather I was in your face you know taking probably two or three to get one in you know so you know there was miles on the clock you know I'd, I'd beat Costa Zoo one of the greatest British successes ever way I fought one of the greatest of all time Floyd Mayweather in many respects the boxes had been tipped, the job had been done, you know, me, I'd got the pennies in the bank and, but I mean, that's not why, I, uh, there was no pressure on me to come back. In fact, everybody was on more the other side, Rick, call it a day now, you've done that. It was only me personally that said, mm -hmm. no, 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 no. I want to leave, uh, you know, a legacy. I mean, it's like, you know, I was I was so gutted when Naz got beat by Barrera that he'd never come back and had another, his first defeat, he'd never come back and give it another, another you know another try and that sort of like stood in my mind i thought to myself i thought well oh he's had it all his own way he's made all his money he's won he's had it all his own way now he's got beat he's made his money that's him done i, I wanted to i wanted to be no 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 and i think that all the, the champions like my reverse who was my hero they, they've all got their legacies you know it's great when when you win and you win and you win and oh got beat thank you <laughs> i'm out now mm -hmm. you know and I, it's not what i it's not what it's not what I yeah. have in here. It's not what I'm what I'm about. What's your biggest weight cut? Biggest weight cut, um, I think, was for my comeback fight um, against Senchenko last time. That was um, just shy of four stone. Uh, that was my biggest weight cut. Um, funny enough, for the exhibition fight, I mean, I've uh, I've already done two stone in already, and I've got uh, just a little under a stone still to. Uh, to go so it's not my biggest weight cut because even before the um, we're talking about my mental health and my problems and all that I think even before um, even before this exhibition fight came along uh, for the last four or five years I've been in a good place I've been happy I've been looking after myself I'm training my boxers every day doing the family thing with my grandkids and my, and my grandkid and my kids and doing the family thing and you know and it's people talking about oh this it's nice it's nice to have a, a date and have a goal and something to set my sights on so i can look after myself keep healthy going it's like going back in time it's really enjoyable but i mean it's not this that has got me on the straight and narrow i was already on the straight and narrow i think it's it's the reason why i was on the straight and narrow is the reason why i can do this if 
that makes um, mm -hmm. any sense. So um, I've been in a good place for a for a good while now, and this is just another thing to add to the add to the list. And when I look back at all the problems that I that I had. And if I had have took my own life, because I used I used to come in here in this very house and sit on that on that couch and I'd be on my own, do you know what I mean? And people say, Well, oh, don't go to the pub and have a drink. I've seen I didn't have to go to the pub and have a drink. I'd come home from the gym, train my lads, tell a few jokes, crack a few smiles, come home on the surface, Rick's all right, and then I'd come in here and I'd just cry. Cry all day. I cry all day and uh and that's you know, even um even family members and loved ones didn't see it. Because you know, I, you know, we're, we're men. <laughs> we don't want to. You know, I'm crying all day. So your misses. I'm crying all day. Love, can you sort me out? Can you? Can you? Can you help me? Can you? No. So I mean, it was. Uh, I think everyone knew I wasn't well, but to what extent? No, I don't think they knew to what extent it was, and they yeah. know now. Did you cover it up well back then? Yeah, yeah, covered it up really well. Yeah, I was a trainer. I mean, always. I'm always like the sort of the party, and it's like I'll be here, I'll be depressed, I go to the gym, which. Obviously, going to the gym helped me. Do you know what I mean? You know, it'd get me out of the house instead of sat there crying. he would get me out of the house. And, and he says, as soon as I walk through the gym door, you know, I go, Hiya, lads. You okay? You all right? What are we going to do today? Hey, what have you been up to? Hey, what, what? You know, and it he, and he was like, So on the surface, everybody, you know, you know, me, me manager, you know, just, just everyone. Ah, oh, Rick's good as gold. You know what I mean? And Jennifer, who I lived with at the time, said he's not well, Rick. You know, something's not quite right, really. You know, all right. You know, all right, Rick. Yeah, I'm good as gold, me, good as gold. Mm -hmm. You know, and then I'd go in the gym, and all my staff would go, "Well, oh, no, he looks all right to us." And that, well, that's that is mental health, isn't yeah. it? That's what we keep telling everybody about. You know, you you know, keeping it in. You got to go and get it out there and tell someone. The main thing is, is telling somebody. But for me, Ricky Atten, the former world champion. I'm not telling anyone that. That's what I thought at the time, and that's what sent me under. Do you think it was harder for you because the top of the tree fought the best of the best, undefeated, winning world titles, defending world titles, being the king of Manchester? Because like, I always remember Frank Bruno as well, when he his mental health went, back then people laughed, the front pages making a fool of him, yeah. pushed him even oh, fucking worse to the end. Water, yeah. 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 Do you think it was harder for you to come forward and say, look, I'm struggling because of your reputation? Uh, I think it was. I think it was. I mean, it's something I always had in me from a young age. I think, and it just when things go wrong in your life, it, tr it just it just triggered it. Uh, it triggered it off, and I'm like I'm an ambassador now for mental health, and it makes me um, feel dead proud. You know, when I, you know, when you know, it was just something like we was on this morning, Britain the other week. You know, when I on mental health week, you know, went on with Campbell and just saying like that and for so many people on your your socials to go watching that interview Rick it's inspired me so much and this and that and I see that as my job now I train my fighters and I'm doing my exhibition about me myself but I see my job as is being an ambassador for mental health to try you know I'm, I work with the Frank Bruno Foundation I'm ambassador for, for Frank's um, organisation and I do Tackling Minds which is a um, which one we're trying to, well, Frank's is trying to get you in the gym doing boxing rather than take a tablet or take this, try and get in the gym and fill your time and do something. Tackling minds is another one, get out in the fresh air, do a bit of fishing, you do something to take your mind, you know. So I'm all for, um, yeah, I'm all for that. I mean. Yeah. How hard was that? What was the the, the, the better part was? Well? Was it the Mayweather defeat or the Pacquiao? What was the hardest one? Uh, I think the Pacquiao one. I think the Mayweather one was, uh, it just set the ball rolling a little bit. And part of me in my mind thought, well, yeah, it is Mayweather, and yeah, you know, you know, I mean, he's beat him, he's beat him. You know, I give him a good fight. I moved up a weight to do so. Yeah, you know, um, but there, yeah, but the Pacquiao defeat. I mean, I've always been a proud man. I mean, I, I was in there fighting against Mayweather. I think, uh, and I think a lot of people felt sorry for me. You know, they think the referee didn't do his job and this that. I'm not saying I'd have won the fight anyway. I'm not saying. The only reason why I lost the fight was because of the referee, but I think people thought Ricky had a bit of hard, was hard done to there, you know. But, but you know, I was always a proud fighter. I made Koshizuka in his stool. I won a world title at welterweight when I really never really was a, a, a welterweight, you know what I mean? I've always be, I've been able to beat people that were better than me, more talent than me, because they had such a big heart. So when you've got that to be destroyed in two, like Manny Pacquiao, and, and laid out like I was, I think that was um, so, so hard for me being a proud fighting man. To be laid out like that was very difficult. And then for to be told, you know, by your trainer and, and just everyone, and he, not even told by them, I knew Rick 
got to hang him up now, son. Yeah, that was a, that was a bad one. And then straight after that, I fell out with me uh, me me parents. Mm -hmm. Is that the worst time of your life? Oh, by 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 a mile, you know. And people say, you know, it sounds daft. I wouldn't change it because it's sort of like it's made me um, the person I am. But um, I wouldn't wish that period on on anyone and mm -hmm. anyone. And you know, people, you know, people never never saw what I was what I was going through because I disguised it. You know. Like you yeah. do. I was the same, mate. I disguised all mine through drink drugs, anger, frustration. Used to get an odd sunbed, get my teeth done, and people thought he's okay. Yeah, yeah. Deep yeah. inside me, I was screaming out for help. I yeah. was nowhere near the level you were at. I and it's the same, it's the same story, I think, with mental health. It's pretty much the same. Yeah. It's the same story. Do you know what I mean? Especially when you're, you know, and it's hard, you know, that's why I think it's good that Frank Bruno did it, I did it, Tyson Fury's done it. I think it's so important that all of us do it you know because we've all been there but i think sometimes when it comes from like you know from boxers where people, i think i don't know maybe it has a bit more of an impact where they think what if we can was going through that why he was crying every day what what and I, you know and it seems to be making an impact so i'll do it all day long you know what yeah. i mean if one save one life you know that's mm -hmm. good enough but I've, and it's it's definitely the 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 way the way forward do you know what i mean I'd, and I'd, I'd, I'd go I'd sit in here, I'd start crying, and then I'd think stuff like, I'll go to the pub and have a pint, you know, a couple of pints, mm -hmm. I'll ease it. And, you know, a couple of pints, as you you probably know, mate, just ease it, puts it into fucking overdrive. Yeah. <laughs> Do you yeah. know what I mean? So it's, 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 yeah. it's horrible. It's the escape of it. Like, I drank because it numbed the pain. I took me away from the You misery. think it numbs it, but it yeah, does. Yeah, it's hundred times the next day. Just for that three, four hours, I felt I felt free. Yeah. And then the gear would come in, and then it's two, three days, and then the depression would seep in even more. And then I'd feel like an even bigger failure because I had two kids, and I'm thinking, how the fuck can I be a dad? Why should exactly. I be sitting in a gaff, not in gear, and drinking, and and feeling as if I'm, I'm Billy Big Bollocks when realise well, I'm just exactly, a loser. That's exactly what it was. Yeah. yeah. How did you? When you're going through your dark stages and you feel alone, you've not got your mum and dad, you fell out with Billy, like you're slipping, you're retired at that point. Like what was your daily routine like? Um it was just basically going getting up, um, having breakfast, you know what I mean? I'd, you know, some mornings I feel all right, some mornings I felt like shit. And then um I'd go to the gym, I'd train my boxers, you know what I mean? And you know, and it, you know, it's not like it. Pretty much, it was pretty much. It was most days, but then every some days you'd feel half all right or anything like that. But no, it, it was just pretty much on a daily basis, just coming home, uh, crying. You know, the missus would come in, and then all of a sudden, you know, I mean, because I lived with her, it's very, you know, it's, you could you can hide it to the public, can't you? Because you're only with the public, or you're with your mates, or with the boxers at the gym, you know, for like a couple of hours at a time. When you live with your missus, it was harder to, you know, to to describe it. And that's why me 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 ex at the time, she knew I was poorly, because I mean, God, you you know you live with the person, so obviously you know you you, you can't you can't turn the charm and the smiles on twenty twenty four hours a bleeding day, can you? So. So, but she knew I was poorly and she was telling everybody. But then when I went to everybody, you know, I was so it was just, it's pretty just the same routine every day. And then sometimes, you know, I'd, I'd come in and I'd get a knife out and just sit there with it at me, at me wrist and just crying and crying and crying. And I'd be going, come on, come on, come on. And I, and I couldn't. And then I'd get up and then I'd go to the pub and then I'd come back and I'd come back and I'd try doing it again. And no, what the, what's happening here? Why can't I do it? You know what I mean? And, and it was pretty much like that for a long period. Yeah. How hard is that to have a knife at your wrist and, and feeling as if you don't want to be here? I do a lot. It's very hard, yeah. you know. And I, you know, I, family was always always very close to me, and it still is very very close to me. But I had no family. Um, I had, you know, I had me, I had me, you know, me, me, me girlfriend. Yeah, that, but I mean, I had, I had no no family. Billy Graham was like, you know, not just my trainer who'd been there through everyone, you know, we swept blood, blood and tears together in that in that ring, he threw every punch with it, but maybe wasn't with him. And they start going through your mind, and then you think, well, I'm I'm never gonna never hear, gonna hear that roar of the crowd again, you know what I mean? I'm never gonna I'm just just heavy just total all around feeling feeling sorry for yourself. Yeah. How did you get out of that? Was that when you got you came out of retirement again? No, I think everyone has a um, has their own way. Don't they? And it's a different thing or whatever. But me, me second, my first child came along. Uh, my second child's baby pardon. Campbell was already here, but and I didn't live with Campbell, so thankfully Campbell didn't wasn't able to see 
what what Jennifer, my ex, saw. But um, but yeah, Millie, my, my my first daughter, she uh, she came along, wasn't planned or anything, and I held her in my arms in the hotel, in the hospital, and I, I said, "Come on, Ricky, it's not about you anymore. You, it's about you. You know, it's about your kids and your family. You know what I mean? Get yourself together. It's not about you. You got others to to think of now." And I, I got a little bit better, but um, still couldn't do it. But then I went to see a psychiatrist, and I just went and opened the door and I fell on my knees and I just went, you need to help me, I'm going to kill myself. I said, I can't do it. I said, I can't do it, I've tried. I said, I'm getting better. I said, I'm trying to do it for me, my little girl that's come along. I said, I'm in the gym training me boxers, I'm doing this and that, but I said, no. I said, it's not working. I said, you need to help me. I said, I'm going to kill myself. And he told me, and I just went for meetings and meetings and he told me things that I couldn't do and he, what makes you happy, Rick? What this and that? What do you think about with this? And he just asked certain questions. He's quite genius, actually, some of the stuff he, you know, he did. And I started just working on little bits and I got myself a little bit, you know, I got myself better and then I started losing weight. Um, and I wasn't thinking about coming back. I was just losing the weight, just getting healthy and enjoying myself again. And then I thought to myself, I thought, listen, you know, what's gone wrong with me? What happened in the paper and what you know, uh, you know how everyone knows of uh, you know I was on the bottom rung of the ladder and everything like that. I said I thought I need to get me, um, I thought I need to get me respect back a little bit and and people to say, well, Rick, we all have problems and you're no different. You don't need to do do that. So it doesn't matter what you need. If it, if I need to do it to put my mind at rest, it doesn't matter about yours, 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 and what you think. Oh, don't worry, Rick. It's only Mayweather. Don't worry, you know what I mean? It's, you know, no, it doesn't matter. It's what I need. And so I made me come back and it was, it ended in defeat. I picked far too tough for the opponent for me come back, but that's me all over. But, um, but no, I, um, I think I was winning and he got me with a body shot and I got beat and, uh, I never looked back since I could move on with my life then, mm -hmm. you know, I made a comeback just to get me respect back. Um, I made a comeback to find out if I've still got it, which I found out I hadn't. <laughs> and that's why I got beat. Mm -hmm. Uh, and a lot of people were a little bit worried. Oh no, another defeat! Where's it? What's going to happen here now to Rick? But it wasn't. I never looked back, and I haven't looked back since. Yeah. How? Obviously, looking back in your career, you've had, what a career! Like phenomenal career. Fought the best of the best. Never shied away from no one. World titles all around the world. Like, it's unbelievable, man. Like you should be proud of everything you've achieved. You've left a legacy now. The good good thing about yourself, right, is you're learning from the pain of the past to try and help others not make the yeah. same mistakes. See if you never drank. How far do you think your career would have lasted? Um, I think I could have got maybe a few more years out of myself if I uh, if I hadn't been up and down in weight and drinking and binge eating and all, just a whole lot. I think I could have got a few more years out of my career. Um, it's not to say that I might not have performed. I could have performed maybe a little bit better because you know, don't I was <laughs> I was doing it with one hand tied behind my back when you think about it, you know. So. Uh, but when I look back now, um, I wouldn't change anything. I wouldn't change anything because I think people, the fan base come and support me, they just go, look at him, he did a rum so-and-so, Ricky, look at him up in weight, down in weight, he's in the pub with a Guinness, he's at the football, oh, he's, he's a, a practical joker, chat the feet down the, you know, all them, all them things. I think that's why I had that, I think, I had the fan base I had because I was a little scallywag. I was a little Manchester. <laughs> I think that's why people like me. Yeah. Obviously, because of the fighting as well. So I had the best following of any British fighter of all time. That's my best achievement, I think, for all my career. It wasn't winning this, winning that, winning that. You know, you mentioned earlier about Frank took 10 over to, to Vegas and I took 40 over in that. That's the great... But the, and there's a reason for that. And I think it's... I'd like to think it's because of the the style of fighting he has, but I think it's because of the other stuff I just mentioned. Yeah. You know, and I firmly believe that. So in doing that, the reason why the, the, I had that support was because I was a little scallywag. I was a little in mm. Manchester chav, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So would I change it? No, I don't think I would have. I don't think I'd have changed a single, a single bit of it. But it doesn't mean to say that <laughs> if any of my boxers or Campbell do the similar to me, they get a, they get a, <laughs> they get a fit here. <laughs> Yeah. But I, me personally, I wouldn't change. I wouldn't change anything. But I don't want my boxers to go down the yeah. same route. How hard was it your last fight? Your mum and dad not being there, and Billy not being there. That was the, probably the hardest, to be honest with you. Because I mean, um, the fact that I'd, I'd had a few fights with Billy, um, not being there when I when I when I when Billy when me and Billy fell out and Billy left, which ultimately me and Billy's made up now. We've made up my mum and dad, and you know, life is. Uh, 
it's so good now. But I mean, not having my mum and dad down there, when the fight started drifting away from me a little bit, I, I, first place I looked was at ringside, you know, when, when I'd, I started off the fight well. And then when he had started to get a little bit of a, you know, get a few good rounds in, and I thought, oh no, he's starting to crawl a little bit of this back here now. I'd looked down at ringside and my mum and dad wasn't there. And I think that, I think that ultimately, um, at the time, um, cause I hadn't made up with my mum and dad. Uh, I think that was the main thing. I'd got past all my problems for all my demons and all this. And I was in a good place and I was in the right place in order to make me come back. But it's only during the comeback when I thought when things were going bad and I looked down at ringside like I used to do when I was fighting and they were always sat there and they wasn't. I think that affected me more. That affected me more. So now I know that I've made up in the exhibition yeah. bout, they're going to be there. Aren't they? <laughs> so, but no, I, uh, yeah. Yeah. It, you know, it was, I mean, I've always been very close to my family, close to my friends, close to my roots. That's the type of guy I was. And the main root of Ricky Hatton for my comeback fight wasn't there at ringside. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not the fact that they're at ringside for the exhibition, my exhibition fight, even if they're there or not, you know what I mean? I've made up with them now. I get on well with the, the families back together now. Yeah. I think if things are going, you no know, problem in the in, in the fight, I don't even need to look there now because I know they're already there with me. Feel their presence. Yeah. Were you not supposed to fight De La Hoya after that fight at Wembley? Or is that a lot of shit? Um, no, I think uh, I think if I'd have beat Pacquiao, they thought that I was going to fight De La Hoya at Wembley. Um, and I think that'd have been there was already already talks in progress a little bit, you know, you know, for that. But obviously, it was obviously a big ask because I mean, Pacquiao was blasting out everyone at the time. He blasted De La Hoya, blasted Cotto, <laughs> blasted blasted me in the end, you know. So. Um, but yeah, that was uh, that was a top. I mean, I generally thought we probably could beat Pacquiao. I thought if I could get past two rounds, you know, and take his best and come on top. I mean, if he hadn't got me when he did, and I'd have still been coming at him rounds three or four, he might have crumbled. But you know, then again, you know, how long's a piece of string? You know what I mean? Well, it's all ifs and buts, isn't it? But I, I um, but no, yeah, there was talk about that. Yeah, yeah. when you see like guys like Tyson Fury, king of the king of the world, like winning all the belts, had all the fame, had all the money. Then seeing him slip and his depression hitting 28 stone, like, did you see a lot of yourself in that as well? And that oh, very much so, very much so. When I, I'd come out of my bad part, and Tyson was just coming into his. And we have a couple of mutual, we have a mutual friend in Manchester, has a pub in Manchester, and I'd be in there sometimes, we'd have a pint, me and Tyson, and he'd say, Oh, we're gonna, last night I'm going, I'm back in the gym Monday, and I, and I used to look at the size of him, he used to think, Tyson. Don't be thinking, come back. Just, just get yourself, get your weight down, get yourself right. Don't be thinking, come back. You know what I mean? And but you know, everyone's uh, everyone's different. I don't know what you know. Tyson triggered it. He just turned around and he said, just from, he said he said the same thing for me kids, for me, me, me just general health. You know, he said then Tyson has to lose ten stone for his uh, mm -hmm. for his comeback fight. I mean, oh, he's, even, he's even beat Ricky Fatton with that one, <laughs> but. Uh, mm. It's just you know what I mean. I think, I think sometimes when you've you've got you've got to make the right decisions. You've got to make. You, I think you've got to go and speak to somebody because if you know if if you could do it yourself, you'd have made you'd you'd have, you'd have done it you'd have done it three years ago, wouldn't you? Yeah. You know what I mean. But you can't do it yourself, mm -hmm. so you go and you go and ask a man who can. Yeah, that's what that's what I think you need. You, you've got to do, and I think that's what Tyson did. And I think it's when I went and saw my psychiatrist, I thought I just sit, I can't take any more pain. I just, my me, me body can't take any more pain, just not being happy, mm -hmm. just not that. I mean, how how many years am I going to spend sat on my couch doing the same shit, you know, crying and doing, you know what I mean? I can't keep going on. And I think it's clear that I can't, you can't do it. Yeah. So you go and see someone that does. And I think the minute you get your head around that, and it, but sadly, some people don't. Some people take their lives, don't they? Yeah, it's sad because I'm an ambassador for a place called Chrissy's House in Scotland, which is a suicide centre. And I've had people in my rope marks on their neck, and when they try to hang themselves, the rope snap. But this, the first thing they says when they try to kill themselves, as soon as they done it, the first thought was, "I don't, I want to live. Yeah. I want to live." But it's sad though. People can hit that dark spot where they think the best option is to take their life. Yeah. And it's it's trying to get that message out before they do take the life in it. Do you know what I mean? And I I you know I don't know I don't know how he did it. The penny dropped for me just at the right time. And I think I think because I think if it if it had gone on and gone on, I think I think it would have took me life. I think it was a case of psyching yourself up, getting doing it. And each time you, you get a little bit closer, and 
Then Millie came on and it was like, oh, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. And it didn't put it right, but it was just something like that. So I went, come on, let's have a proper fucking think about this now. Yeah. And that's what, um, you know, that's what I, I, I did. And I had a proper think about it and I still couldn't do it. And then I decided to go and speak to myself. So I was, you know, yeah, so like, you know, Millie put the brakes on for me and thought like, Med, come on, you know, you, you, you're saying the right stuff, but you know, you need to have a proper you know yeah. switch on now and that's when millie come along you just sort of like you know put the speed bumps in front of it because uh, i've spoke to joe kozag he's been on frank bruno now yourself that like, do you think there should then they've spoke very openly and honestly about their struggles their pain and do you think there should be more things in place for boxers after the time to fill absolutely. that void but i mean there's a the professional footballers association in there mm -hmm. and there's a club manchester united or manchester city or liverpool or you know whoever that you know once you've left the club, you know, I mean, they, they can, I don't know, maybe they can go back to the club. There's somebody there, in, there's, there's something there in, in in place that can that can help them. In boxing, there isn't. The thing is with boxing is, is you're self-employed. You don't have a club behind you, you're self-employed. So, I mean, but I think maybe boxing needs to make a little bit more of a stand of just, you know, how do you cope with retirement? Someone there to advise them what they do with the money. Boxers, we come from council estates. We don't come from Cambridge or Oxford, you know what I mean? And if you become a world champion, you get all this money nine times out of ten. They don't know what to do with it. They're not educated enough. When we're not educated enough to, to deal with it. Mm -hmm. So that's why so many boxers, you know, lose the money in the end. So it's stuff like that, I think, that needs putting yeah. in... Um, in place as well and it's such a sad thing i'm not calling any promoters because i get on well with all the promoters I always always have done but it's as if you're like right 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 he's finished now right where's the next prospect come on you know what i mean and it's uh, it's a conveyor belt and you know oh he's great but you know then him there's fucking forgot about you know yeah just a number yeah. Then, yeah how going forward for the future brother what's your plans obviously you've got your well fight. july 2nd is my, my plan um but it's great. I mean, you know, come July 2nd, if people can say, you know, a lot of people say, what are you doing it for? You know, and uh, oh, we don't want to see you get hurt. You're not going to see me get hurt. You know, the big, I mean, I'm doing it with me mate, Marco Antonio Barrera, bigger gloves, shorter rounds, less rounds. It's going to be massively entertaining. It's going to be a bit brilliant. But if one person says, look at the shape he's got in, look what he did there. You know, do, do you remember him 10 years ago? See the state of him 10 years ago when he was nearly trying to top himself and everything like that. Look at him now. Is that a bad thing? No. Is it, you know, is, is it me training with me youngsters in the gym every day, you know, I mean, doing the same thing as they're doing at 43. Come on, come on. One of them said to me the other day, they went, Jesus, I'm going to have to pull my socks up a little bit here. Went, right, because he said, if you're doing out 43, I need to start working a bit hard. <laughs> it's just little positives like, mm -hmm. like, like that, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And, and there's no better time to do it because I've, I've, I'm in a bastard for mental health. I've suffered for mental health. I've lost family through the lockdown through mental health. And I'm going to say, listen, it, you know, you, the, the bad days don't last forever. Look what you can do. You just got to do the right yeah. things. So there's nothing, you know, there's going to be a, you know, a, a massive donation to, to charity to help mental health as well. I can't see anything negative to come out of this. Yeah. And, um, and that's what I'll continue to do. And after July 2nd comes along, you know, Ricky Atten will still do the family thing, will still train his boxers, will still look after himself, still try and bang the word for mental health, loving life with the family now. And um, my message is, you know, you can turn it around the same. It's simple. Yeah, how hard is it now that your son's professional? He's 8-0, you know, Campbell. Like, are you happy with that? Or do you well, struggle? I didn't want him to go professional because um, I... I I try to work hard for me pennies so that my kids don't have to, you know, but for him to go into the hardest game of all with a dad that achieved what I did and with the social media world now where his, his apprenticeship's there for everyone to see and if he has a bit of an iffy night, you know what I mean, it's, you, you shit, you're this, you're this, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And he's got his head, uh, he's got his head round it now and I, I couldn't be any uh, prouder, not just the way he's progressing, how he's improving, how he's taking the knocks, you know, and, and deflecting, you know, he's, we're all, we all get knocked, don't we? We're all going to get bad, yeah. bad, 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 but he just keeps deflecting it, you know, he's he not asked, you know what I mean? He's just focused on his career and it's, it's brilliant. But I mean, it's horrible to see him, uh, 
to see him box. Mm -hmm. Who's, really yeah. But I mean, it, just as if, just as I thought, you know, just as you're asking me, worried about him, he, he'd probably be saying the same thing. How do you feel about your dad fighting? <laughs> he'd probably, he's probably answering it the same. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> what are we doing? Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> but you know, we're, we're, you know we're, we're fighters and even though I'm retired, we're not dead and I know my best days are behind me, but I'm trying to do it for my own well-being, for other people's own well-being. And I'm trying to do a little bit of positive with it. Yeah, that's the only way you can look at it. It's take positives yeah, for everyone. Yeah. You're getting fit. You're getting well, healthy. You'd either see me here now, you know, in in, in shape, or you'd either see yeah. me, you know, four stone every year wanting to kill myself. Yeah, but it's good to you seeing positives, and you you've got a bit of. You've got a, a goal and a, an end product and fighting in front of fans again, getting your music yeah, on. Yeah, hearing that there's only one yeah. Ricky out. And because, I mean, that, that's one thing you miss when you retire, the scream of the crowd, the mm. nervousness when you walk into the ring. That's the, uh, when it's, that's the worst thing at the time. You think, oh, what am I doing this for? What am I doing this for? Mm. And then when it's gone, it's the one thing you miss. And I'm going to get the chance to do that again. And, uh, you know, you're retired. You're not dead. Yeah. Once you've, once you've, He's still got to set goals for life. Everyone sets goals for their life out there. And Ricky Hatton's not changed just because he's retired. Who's the hardest fight you've ever you've fought? Um, do, 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 do. I would say Mayweather, to be honest with you. I mean, the Pacquiao fight was like a one-punch knockout. You know, That goes without saying how hard it was. But, I mean, I've had a moan about the referee, how he didn't let me fight, and he didn't. But uh, it's the first time I've come back from the changing room after fighting you know, Floyd Mayweather, and I was sat down there on my own, I was sat in the locker room, and I was, I was just thinking to myself, I was laughing, I'm thinking, oh my God, he was good, you know, getting him on the ropes, and I could, you know, I wasn't the biggest puncher, but my accuracy was my thing, I could put me left up to the body on a one pence piece, you know, and I could always find the target, and he was so, even though, even when I got, you know, one in, he got an half, a half block on it, or a half glance, or a half pull, it was, uh, it really, uh, it really was. And even though, you know, I, I still think the referee did a crap job. He did me no favours, you know, and that. But, I mean, um, um, I, 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 I was successful before the box, mate, Floyd Mayweather, but I think fighting Floyd Mayweather changed my life, my family's life, my, you know, my, my kid's life, my grandkids' life, my grandkids' kids' life, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? It, it, it really did, you know, change our lives. And even though I'm having a bit of a moan referee this time, I'll be forever grateful for being born in the era of Floyd Mayweather because what I've got is probably due to fighting Floyd. And your own ability, mate, and the care yeah, yeah, you've yeah. had. Yeah, like, yeah, all yeah, comes yeah. hand in hand, mate. Yeah, like, yeah. That, like, just before we finish up, like, for people that's maybe struggling with mental health, you've been there, you've lived it, you've thought there's no way out. You've got out, now you're fighting again, you're looking well, you're losing weight, you're positive, you're seeing the world in a different place, which is a beautiful yeah, thing. Yeah, you know, it, go, it goes without saying, you know, for all them things you've just, you just mentioned there, you know what I mean? It, you, can, you can do it, you know, you can do it, but, you know, it sounds really brutal, but if anything, I've always been brutal and I've always been honest. It's only you can do it. You can't sit there crying about it. I know why you sat there crying about it, of course, because I've been there, but it's only you can make the difference. It's only you can make the difference. Only you can do it. You only you can make that decision. People will be saying, "How are you? How are you doing? How are you doing?" It's you that's got to take it on board and go, "Yeah, I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to try something. I'm going to do something." You know, instead of feeling sorry for yourself. The best way I think about mental health, I describe it as a bit like a hangover. <laughs> you know, it's like sometimes if you have a hangover, you sit in the bed, don't you? And you think, "Oh, I don't feel well." The minute you get up and go and do something, you feel better. Yeah. And it's the same with the mental health. The longer you stand there feeling sorry for yourself and everything like that, you know, the worst it's going to go. Yeah. You've got to get up and go and do something else. And if you do, you know, your life will come good again. Yeah. Exercise is key. And that, that, Exercise is key. It's all key. the natural it chemicals. Be positive, you know yeah. I mean? All the natural chemicals, the endorphins, the serotonin. Yeah, absolutely. And it That's why I would say go to the gym. You know what I mean? Just blow off a bit of steam, put the gloves on, hit the punch yeah. bag. Go and sit on a lake, do a little bit of fishing, mm -hmm. go for a walk. You know, them fell walks now that where people are walking. That seems a new common thing to do. But I'm all for it. We're walking over the top of the hills yeah. and all over the yeah. yeah. Do something like that. Nature. Yeah. Just before we finish up, brother, I know you're a beloved Man City fan. You've got a big game on Sunday. Aston Villa, you won, you won the league. What's the prediction? Um, typical City fashion. I mean, the, the league should have been over for us. We should have won it, you know. And even the last couple of games, it sh we should have put it to bed. But in typical City fashion, we never make it easy for ourselves. In fairness, Liverpool had a very, very good team and, and that. But I think, uh, I think no, I think we've um, we you know, we beat we beat Villa. We win we win the league on Sunday. And I think the the thing is for a City fan is we've we've given Liverpool half a chance. I think they still need a miracle 
Liverpool, you know, in order to do, but it's 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 doable. And we've 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 given that doable <laughs> chance with what we've done in the last few games. But ultimately, I think the best team of the season has been Man City, and they you know, and they think they'll deserve to win it. I think they will do on Sunday. Would you like to finish up on anything, brother? No, nothing. Just um, just you know, just everybody, you know, if you're coming to me exhibition on July the second. You know, it's going to be a fantastic night, brilliant, and all them out there with mental health. You know, just. Uh, just you've got to make the just got to make the it'll come good. Life will come good for you again. You just got to do the positive things in order to do it, you know. And only you can can do it. Ricky, absolute legend, brother. Legend. Phenomenal career, mate, and everything you're doing for mental health. It's proud of you. It's unbelievable. You're you're, you're changing lives and you're helping save lives, which yeah. is all about. But very, very God kind. bless Cheers. you. Good luck with the fight, and see you in the future, brother. Nice one. God bless.